Our speaker today is John F. Lyons. He is an author and educator focusing on 20th century British and American history. He was born in London uh, and immigrated to the United States in 1994, where he had got a PhD in history from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, Mr. Lyons is a professor of history at Joliet Junior College in Illinois, where he teaches uh, British history, U.S. history, and world history. Uh, he's published a number of articles, uh, encyclopedia entries, and book reviews on a variety of historical topics, as well as the teaching of history. So please enjoy a very interesting look at a very specific time and place with the Beatles, Chicago, and the 1960s. Okay, hello everybody. Hello. And, uh, thanks for coming out today. It's a real pleasure to see so many people here. And um, I'm just going to tell you about what I'm going to do. Well, first of all, I should obviously thank the Des Plains uh, History Centre for putting this on. It's a really great thing that they do here. <coughs> I'm sure we're all um, very grateful for what they do. But um, yeah, in terms of what I want to do today is um, I'm looking around this room and I can obviously see that you're all far too young to remember the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so what I want to do is I want to basically start by uh, saying to you that I'm going to just pretend you know nothing about the Beatles. <coughs> and so we're going to just go very slowly and then speed up about uh, who the Beatles were. But specifically what I want to do is concentrate on uh, when the Beatles came to America. And of course they came to America in uh, 1964. And uh, what I'm going to do is try and uh, recreate what it was like in America in 1964 when the Beatles arrived. And what I'm going to do is look at it through the lens of the local area. So we're going to look at Chicago, the Chicago land area, and how they responded to uh, the Beatles uh, from 64 onwards. And in particular, this is what we're going to look at, just to give you an idea. So we're going to look at, again, I will keep this brief, because I'm sure most of you do actually know who the Beatles were. I'll just very briefly say uh, who they were, where they came from. And then there's so many connections between the Beatles and Chicago. I mean, there is li just so many. And so what I'm going to do is just really give you the tip of the iceberg and just mention a few of the, the uh, big connections between Chicago and the Beatles. You can't basically talk about the Beatles without mentioning Chicago. I think Chicago is that important to the Beatles story. Okay. Anyway, and then I'm calling this Tales of Joy because a lot of people, uh, when the Beatles arrived, they saw it really as a really joyous moment. And like I said, I'm going to try and look through their eyes at uh, how the Beatles were perceived when uh, they came here in the 60s. And then what we're going to look at, one of the major influences of the Beatles, without a doubt, is in, uh, they influenced so many people to pick up instruments, form bands, and uh, you know, contribute to a really thriving music scene uh, in America, and certainly in Chicago. Chicago had one of the major music scenes of the 1960s, and so I'm going to just uh, look at that for a short while. And then we're going to finish up on uh, uh, a downward note. We're going to finish up on Tales of Fear. Because you might not think it now when you see uh, Ringo Starr or Sir Ringo Starr with his uh, peace and love signs or uh, Sir Paul McCartney, who we all want to have as our grandpa, you'd never believe that people actually uh, disliked them intensely. But I'm afraid they did. And we're going to end on those people that feared the Beatles coming to America. I know. I'm going to bring you all down. And then what we're going to do, if you could keep, you, I'm sure some of you got questions or contributions, and what I'll do is I'll make sure that we keep a time at the end for that. So if you can keep the question to the end, it'll make it uh, a bit more manageable. Okay, so everybody happy? Yes. You've all got your coffee? Yes. Great, I had tea, so, but, uh, <laughs> you know, so maybe, that isn't, but maybe that's not what I should do, but uh, technology <coughs> is not my forte, but let's see if this works. Here we go. Look at that. Maybe it is my forte. Okay, in terms, of, uh, the, so in terms of where they came from, obviously they came from uh, Liverpool, which is in the north of England, and uh, you can see it, and it's a dock uh, city there. And uh, in terms of why it's important, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is because uh, it was so far from the centre of the, uh, the music and the entertainment industry. The music and entertainment industry was dominated by London. I mean, London, everywhere, everything was in London. And so the Beatles were always seen as outsiders. To use that American phrase, hillbillies. And uh, the other thing about this uh, distance, it meant that that's why it took so long for them to get a recording contract. Because really, they started playing really in 57 or so, and uh, as a band, probably you'd say 1960, but they didn't get a contract until 1962. 
And so therefore, I think that does play a factor in it, the fact that they were seen as so outside from the English, uh, uh, sorry, from the London establishment. In terms of who were the Beatles, I'll just do this very briefly. Uh, John Lennon was pretty much the leader, the founder of the group. And uh, when he left school, he was born in 1940, October 1940. And like all of them, they were all war babies. They were all born during World War II. And uh, he then, when he was a teenager, he formed the group called the Quarrymen, which was named uh, after the school he went to. And uh, this is a picture of him, you can see him just in the middle there, with his uh, plaid shirt on and his grease back hair, because they all loved Elvis Presley. Okay, uh, the second one to join the Quarrymen was Paul McCartney. And uh, he became the uh, bass player in the band. He played lead guitar first, but then he switched to uh, bass guitar. And again, you can see him in this picture on the uh, left there, and John Lennon's on the right. And this is the first picture we have, the two of them playing together on stage. So you can see them uh, here. And this is November 1957. Okay? So they met that summer. They met in the summer of 57. The third... Oh, I've, got, I've gone over one. Ignore that. The, uh, the third George. member to join was George Harrison, and he was a friend of uh, Paul McCartney's. That was, that was how he was introduced to uh, John Lennon. And again, this is the first picture we have three the three of them together. Wow. And again, if you look at the date, you can see it's March 58, which you, we think he joined about that time. And it's taken by Paul McCartney's <coughs> brother, Mike uh, McCartney, or what became known as Mike McCartney. Anyway, you can see that, look how young they look. Yeah. They're just babies, aren't they? Yeah. And in terms of George uh, Harrison, he was the youngest member of the group. Okay. Okay. okay, the last fourth one there. There was other drummers uh, before him, but uh, when Ringo Starr joined uh, the Beatles in uh, the summer of 1962, August 1962, that meant now that the four iconic members of the Beatles are together. So now we have uh, John, Paul, George and Ringo. And Ringo was the oldest and uh, he obviously played drums. And uh, this is the <coughs> first picture we have of the four of them together. And there's a lot of sort of uh, strange things about the Beatles story, coincidences and very strange sort of happenings that make a lot of people think it's kind of magic. But this picture was taken on August 20th, 1962 and it's pretty much the first picture we have of the four of them together. The last picture we have of the Beatles together, the four of them, was again taken in 1969. You won't believe what date. Can you believe that? The same date. Spooky. Okay, anyway, so uh, in terms of uh, their first record, the first record they released was this one on the left here, which was Love Me Do, and that was in October 1962. And that record uh, did quite well in the charts. I mean, a lot of people think it, uh, it wasn't, but this was a debut band uh, their first record, so you know, it, it did quite well. But it was Please Please Me that really became their first breakthrough hit in the UK, and that was early 1963. So you can see now we're talking about uh, 60 years ago, just under uh, 60 years ago. But anyway, that was so Please Please Me really is their uh, breakthrough hit in the UK. So that is early 1963, okay? Over that summer, they played in more and more, or I should say, sorry, uh, bigger and bigger theatres and music halls. They started off in clubs. By the end of the year, they were playing in uh, the London Palladium, which was a uh, major, the major music venue in the UK. And uh, also, they uh, played in front of the Royal Family by the end of the year. So they went from playing clubs to basically play in front of the Royal Family by the end of that year, by 1963. And th they were getting such a reaction that they were getting uh, headlines like this. This is from uh, uh, the Daily Mirror, is an English newspaper. And the headline is Beatlemania. Mm -hmm. And the part I like is where it says, it's happening everywhere, even in sedate Cheltenham. <laughs> that's like saying, it's happening everywhere, even in sedate Des Plaines. <laughs> so anyway, that's, uh, that's about, so by the end of 1963, they are a phenomena in the UK. They really are. I mean, all their records are reaching number one, playing in front of the Royal Family, TV shows, they're a phenomena. Unknown in the US. How is this possible? And of course, that's because they never had TikTok. <laughs> okay, but anyway, so I'm, I'm going to stop it there on that and move to Chicago because it, they were a phenomenon in England but unknown in the, uh, the US, okay, by the end of 63. Okay, now in terms of the Chicago connections, and this we're going to build up to how they come to uh, America, 
is uh, there's no doubt about it that the, 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 the Beatles, they loved American music. All their music was American, really, for the, at least for the first two or three years. And uh, much of it was influenced by uh, Chicago. And you probably know all of these, but in case uh, the Gene Krupa, he was a, a big band drummer, yeah. And Ringo Starr, all, always, you know, many interviews, he says that uh, he was the inspiration for him picking up the drums because he was such a gregarious sort of figure. He looked like he was enjoying himself. But funnily enough, just a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, I was uh, listening to a new uh, interview with Pete Best, who was the drummer before Ringo Starr. And guess what? They asked him, who was your major inspiration in becoming a drummer? He said Gene Krupa. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. The same per so uh, it shows you how big Gene Krupa was in the uh, the UK. But anyway, the next two there you're going to see is obviously rock and roll. They were absolutely enthralled with rock and roll, mm. and they loved Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry, from beginning to end, they played his songs in concert, and I mean literally to the end. In 1966, when they stopped touring, they still played Chuck Berry on uh, tour, even though by that time they had a hundred of their own songs to play. Mm. They loved Chuck Berry, they loved Bo Diddley, and of course that's Chess Records in Chicago. Mm. Uh, the other ones you know said, they loved uh, soul music, American soul music, African American soul music, and of course we all know that they loved uh, Motown music, you know, that was the, uh, the you know, that is commonly they talked about <coughs> Motown, but they also <coughs> talked about a lot of Chicago artists. And these are the Chicago artists that they talked about a lot, and that is Sam Cooke, Major Lance, and The Impressions. And The Impressions are that uh, band that Curtis Mayfield, you, you're probably familiar with them, uh, was in. And they, they loved all these groups that came from Chicago. And I just happened to be one day looking at a uh, few uh, uh, photos of the Beatles, and this shows them coming back from their first visit to the US. So this is February 1964. They're getting off the plane in uh, London and whenever they went to the US they used to um, buy records. They used to buy albums in uh, America and uh, they're coming off this plane. You can see quite clearly they've got records under their arms and you can see quite clearly that uh, Paul McCartney has got that Major Lance record mm -hmm. under his arm. Now the Ringo one, that really uh, for a long while I couldn't quite work out what that album was until one day I realised that it was that one there. And it's, uh, it's a, a golden oldie sort of compilation record. But guess what? It's full of Chicago artists, including The Impressions, Gene Chandler, all these other ones as well. So it gives you an, uh, an idea about how much they loved uh, uh, Chicago uh, uh, soul music. Now the last two on there, I don't think the Beatles <coughs> were ever really influenced by blues music, Chicago blues music. Okay, uh, that was more the Rolling Stones and the Animals and groups like Yardbirds, groups like that. But uh, there's no doubt about it, they revered them. They talked a lot about how much they liked their music, even though they didn't incorporate it into their sound. And if you listen to these songs, um, which I'm sure you all will when you go home, you'll see that the, they both mention Chicago blues greats. So if you listen to Come Together, you'll hear Muddy Waters is mentioning it. And if you listen to For You Blue, Elmore James is mentioning it. So anyway, so there, there definitely was a Chicago influence in terms of music on the Beatles sound. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, uh, their records, their records were released in the UK. Uh, I showed you there earlier, which was Parlophone, which was a, a, a record <coughs> label that obviously was based in London. But the, the, the overriding parent company was called EMI. Okay? And EMI also had a subsidiary in the US, and that was Capital Records. Okay? And so every time that the uh, EMI had a record from an English artist, they would send it to Capital in the US, and then it was up to Capital whether they uh, released it in the US, because obviously the Capital uh, knew the American market better than EMI did. Okay, and so they sent them Love Me Do, and uh, Capital turned it down. They sent them Please Please Me, and Capital again turned them down. Now, why is that? You know. And from this perspective, we're all basically saying, these people are nuts. You know? <laughs> but of course, at the time, they weren't nuts. Because what they knew was that a British artist don't make it in America. I'm sorry, they don't. Before the Beatles, there might have been the odd one-hit wonder, but no British act had had a sustained career in the US before the Beatles. And the <coughs> previous one to try that was actually on Capitol Records, and that was somebody called... Cliff 
Richard. And I can see a lot of you staring at me with blank faces. <laughs> and that was exactly the look that uh, Capitol Records had uh, in 1963 or whatever, because he bombed. <coughs> and yet he was a household name mm -hmm. in the US. Okay, some of you know them. But anyway, yeah. but uh, in terms of the Beatles, household name in the, U in the UK or begun, becoming uh, one, Capitol Records, they'll never make it over here. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the, uh, when Please Please Me came out, the, uh, the Beatles and their manager and their producer, they realised that it actually was a good record. Please Please Me is a, is a hit record. I think most people would agree on that. And so therefore, when Capitol turned it down, they offered it to a number of American, other American record labels. They all turned it down again. Okay? Until they offered it to an African-American owned <coughs> record label based on Michigan Avenue into Chicago, and that is, of course, VJ Records. And so that's how VJ became the first record label in America to release a Beatles single, which was Please Please Me, February uh, 1963. Uh, uh, and uh, then they also became the first American record label to release a Beatles album, which is introducing <coughs> the Beatles, and that was January 1964. Now, in terms of VJ Records, it's, it's a great story. I mean, you, I, I I haven't got time to talk about them tonight, but it is a great story. But one of the, it's a tragic story as well, because uh, they actually went broke in 1966. And they lost the Beatles. They, they, well, I'll just tell you very briefly, because it is amazing. They actually, when they signed uh, a contract with EMI to release the Beatles in America, believe it or not, the contract was for five years. They had five years' worth of Beatles records to release in America. Now, if you think about this, they signed this in January 62, okay? If you think about, 63, sorry, 63. If you think about five years from then, that would have meant VJ could have released Rubber Soul, wow. they could have released Revolver, wow. and Sergeant Pepper. Oh, wow. It could have been, Sergeant Pepper could have been on VJ. But because of uh, a number of circumstances which I won't go into, uh, basically they, uh, they lost the licensing agreement with EMI, they had to go to court, they couldn't compete with the capital records in terms of, anyway, so they lost it and they finally went broke in 1966. And for many years, uh, I, uh, I used to walk down Michigan Avenue and I used to sadly look at that building. And I used to say to myself, there's history there. I know, I'm tearing up just thinking about this now. But anyway, so in terms of what happens is uh, in the spring of 2021, I happened to be walking down Michigan Avenue, and what would I see? Somebody bought the building. Yeah. Yes. Somebody has bought the building. And not only is that somebody, the somebody is a coffee shop. Okay, and uh, so you can just about see it there. That's the they've turned it into a coffee shop, and the name of the coffee shop is Overflow Coffee. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a great name, but you know what do I know? But anyway, Overflow <laughs> Coffee. And uh, but the nice thing about it is they bought the building knowing the history. Mm -hmm. You know, if Starbucks had bought it, what would they have done? <laughs> exactly. You don't even have to uh, answer that. You know what they would have done? Gunned it. But anyway, in terms of what. Uh, uh, VJ, oh sorry, this Overflow Coffee did, is they turned it into a museum to VJ Records. So if you go to uh, Overflow Coffee and you walk through the door, you see on the wall is all the records that they released, or a number of them, and you can, can you just about see the Beatles one in the bottom corner there? Yes. Yeah. And then if you go further into the coffee shop, you'll see at the back, they have a big blown up picture of the original owners which was uh, Vivian Carter and James Bracken. You can probably just about make them out. And then, as you're sitting there having your cappuccino, <laughs> or your cafe latte, or in my case, hot tea, <laughs> that uh, they play over the sound system VJ Records. Excellent. So next time you're down Michigan Avenue, pop into Overflow and uh, you can experience the, uh, the whole set of VJ records. So anyway, so th they were the ones that released the first Beatles records in America. Okay, VJ, yeah. Okay, uh, the first record label, so we know the first record label then is a Chicago-based VJ records that released their records, but also uh, Chicago is another major role in the story because the first uh, ra uh, radio station to play the Beatles was WLS. Yeah, and I think that's pretty much, I, I wouldn't say 100% sure, but it's pretty much sure. 
And one of the reasons we know that is because they used to have these surveys where they used to bring out every week. They <coughs> used to say what records they were playing, and they used mm -hmm. to uh, number them. And you could just, I don't know if you can see it back there, but at the number 40 on that survey is uh, the Beatles. And there's a couple of interesting stories about this. One is, it's March the 8th, 1963. Spooky. Yeah. 60 years ago yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. What, what a shame we didn't do this yesterday. But anyway, 16 years ago yesterday. And the other uh, thing about it is, you probably can't see it, they spelt the name of the band wrong. <laughs> Two T's. <laughs> you can't win them all. Anyway, so that's uh, basically W. And I think it also play a big role, because then the Beatles finally break in America in January 64. That's their breakthrough. And uh, I think WS plays a big role in that, because uh, they had a huge signal that could be heard all over the Midwest, Canada, and then even people I've spoken to in the southern states say that they used to listen yeah. to WLS. And uh, it had a nickname, World's uh, Loudest Station. <laughs> so uh, but anyway, and so therefore, I think when uh, the Beatles did break, WLS definitely plays a big role in that. But anyway, do you all know who the DJ that played the first? Dick Beyondy. 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 Say that again? On top of a pizza. Yeah, hey, that's the man. You got it. I won't play that record, but anyway. In terms of uh, Dick Biondi, there's a documentary coming out about him, which I'm really looking forward to seeing. And uh, I know that they're having a little bit of problems getting the, the, the final bit of money to release it, but it should be out soon. And uh, yeah, it should be really good. I'm looking forward to that. But anyway, so uh, what do I want to say there? Nothing. Do I? Why do I got this up there? No idea. Let's go. Okay. Now, I, I, again, I could talk about so many connections, but we haven't got time. But just another one that I kind of like, and that is, you all probably know that the Beatles really made the breakthrough, as I say, in January 64, when they released uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand. But their first real sort of like uh, live appearance on American TV was on, in February. 1964 and the Ed Sullivan show, yeah? And of course, if you ever watch that show, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, you'll notice that uh, Ringo Starr is very visible. And he did that on purpose. He's, what, he's not one of these drummers that want to be at the back where you can nobody sees him. He wanted to be part of the group. So he's <coughs> on this big riser, right up in the air. You can see his drum bass right on the screen. And of course, what is written on that drum bass? <laughs> Well, no, 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 it could be Ringo, but no, it's actually got the Beatles on, but it's also got the name of the uh, uh, company that produced the drum and Ludwig. And of course, Ludwig is Chicago based. And when they came to uh, uh, America in 64, they, they came to Chica uh, Chicago in September of 64, of course, Ludwig was very grateful to uh, Ringo Starr uh, for all the publicity he gave them. So they, they presented him with a gold drum. That's what wow. it is there. And uh, the interesting part was that the one on the right there was the president of the company. And of course, they made so much money out of the Beatles. I mean, they, they had to put their uh, factory on the uh, uh, double shift because there were so many drums we made. And then they even had to build a new factory. So that's so much money they made. And uh, he does admit this. The, the uh, owner of the company said that he bought a luxurious house and he calls it the house that Ringo built. <laughs> and he's not far wrong. So anyway, that's uh, another Chicago uh, connection is they played in America on uh, uh, three summer tours. Okay, So they played in, the, in America in 64, 65, 66. And they played in each one of those tours, they played in Chicago. So they played Chicago 64, 65. And they played, o overall they played five shows one in 64 and two the, uh, each of the other years. And that meant that the only other place where they played more concerts was New York. So that was, uh, mm -hmm. the, they played five shows in uh, Chicago. But, and this is the big but, the in 1965, they played at what was then known as White Sox Park. Yeah. Okay? And uh, in terms of how many people came to see them that day, they played an afternoon show and an evening show. And the, if you combine the audience, the number of people that went to see him that day was over 60,000 people. That was 20th of August, 1965. Okay, over 60,000. More people saw them on that day in Chicago than they did on any other stop of any of their North American tours. Wow. Take mm -hmm. that, New York. <laughs> yeah, because when they played at uh, Shea Stadium, it was about 56,000. 
Over 60,000 saw them that day in, the, in Chicago. <coughs> and so a matter of fact, I, and, so that, that's over their whole history. No, on that one day. No, no, I mean, it was the biggest turnout. Oh, over, over the whole history. Turnout. Okay, so in North America, for certain. Okay, so they never played to a bigger audience in North America. <coughs> in Europe, certainly. They never played to... The, the, the venues weren't that big in Europe. The only other place where I could think probably more people saw them is actually when they played in the Philippines. And they played in the Philippines in 66, they played in a football stadium which held 40,000 people. And if you look at photographs of it, it does look pretty packed. So maybe that was 80,000 people saw them in the Philippines. But besides that, I don't think anywhere else. I can't think of anywhere else where they would have that sort of audience <coughs> on one day. So it gives you an idea. But anyway, but the other interesting thing is they used to have support acts. You know, the, 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 uh, and the support acts would only play for about 10 or 15 minutes. It wasn't yeah. long. But anyway, they were the support acts, if anybody remembers any of them. Kurt's back. They had disco dancers there that were doing sort of like the uh, show. Cannibal and the Headhunters. You know, the, yeah, you know them. And then Sounds Incorporated were an English act. And then Brenda Holloway was a, a Motown act. So that was the groups that played. How much would you have paid that day? In terms of the, the prices, 250 was the cheapest tickets. The most expensive, and look at this audience, I don't think most of you could have afforded this, 550. 550. Now, if you want to know how much that is in present day numbers, present day money, you probably have to multiply that by 10, maybe 12, not much more. So therefore, we're saying in, in the modern day, that would probably have been about $60. If you go and see Bruce Springsteen now, or uh, Taylor Swift. I'm sure a lot of you want to go and see Taylor Swift. Three thousand dollars for a wow. ticket. Paul McCartney, hundreds for a ticket. That's what it was like. Now we're all sitting here and we're all sort of uh, saying to ourselves, "Wow, wouldn't it be great if we could actually go back to that day? Go back to August the 20th, 1965. See the Beatles on that day in Chicago." Well, because of technology, and I'm thanking Brian for this. He did the technology here. We we're able to go back there. And we're going to go back in a spaceship that is going to take us back. So put on your seatbelts, because <laughs> we're going back to August the 20th, 1965. Here we go. Okay. Oh. Eventually. <laughs> I'm going to talk through this. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, the first thing to say is what you're going to see is they're walking towards the uh, stage where they play. And they stayed, uh, played on a platform that was set up in the middle of the field. And the people you're going to see shaking their hands are the WLS DJs. thing to say then, if you were there that day, you never saw them. They were so far away, there were tiny little figures, mm -hmm. there was no big screens like you see now. If you go to see Paul McCartney now, there's huge screen, none of that. Uh, you had to bring binoculars basically to see it. So the first thing to say is, you never saw them. The second thing to say is you couldn't hear them. <laughs> that's basically because they had such rudimentary sound system. They had small amps, a few microphones. They were singing through the PA. And of course, everybody was screaming. So you never heard a word. <laughs>
So the first thing is you couldn't see them, second thing you couldn't hear them, the third thing is they only played for 30 minutes, 3-0. Oh now wow. to give you some idea, and no, no encores, they just play 30 minutes and then they're off. But to give you some idea how long that is, I've been talking for just over 30 minutes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Somebody at the back said it seemed longer, but no. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, it gives you an idea. Anyway, there's many other connections with Chicago, but uh, let's move on to what it was like in Chicago when the Beatles arrived in America. And of course, like I said, the, the, the breakthrough was really the Ed Sullivan show. That's, uh, you know, the, they'd already had a number one record with uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand. And then on the evening of February the 9th, 1964, they appear on the Ed Sullivan Show. There's very few channels then. A lot of Americans used to watch that show. The family would gather around. They watched that show. And then the following morning, people went to school or to work or whatever. It was on a Sunday night, the show. And uh, they all said, did you see that band last night, that English group on the Ed Sullivan Show? And what was the first thing that they all said to each other? <coughs> the Beatles. Their hair. Their hair. <laughs> that was the first thing. Oh, yeah. They were wearing wigs. No, they weren't wearing wigs. Yeah, they were. Did you see that hair? No boy is here. Anyway, that's basically the conversation. And so a lot of young men watched that night on uh, April the 9th. And you know what they saw? They saw girls screaming. <laughs> and when boys see girls screaming, they think, I want some of that. <laughs> and so basically what they did is, they ran down to the Loop in Chicago to get their Beatle haircut. Now again, oh, wow. I found this out to my uh, detriment, but it takes a long while to grow hair. <laughs> and these kids weren't going to wait. And so they went down to buy their wigs. And you probably say to yourself, this is a picture of some of them buying the wigs in uh, the loop, but you probably say to yourself, you know, oh, you know, couldn't have been that many people with, uh, with this, this crazy, boys this crazy. But anyway, this is from the Daily News, uh, a Chicago newspaper that uh, no longer exists from the 60s. And uh, they were interviewing somebody who was a sales clerk in, the, uh, in one of these stores. And this is what she said, okay? Well, I'll read it from here. Shall I read it from here? Yeah. They are selling like hotcakes. The man who manufactures the wig is turning them out at the rate of 20,000 a day with orders for more than 300,000. I'm not going to say any more. <laughs> what more is there to be said? Unbelievable. That's, un that's just... When I, actually, the first time I read that in the newspaper, I had to look at it and I thought, that can't be right. Yeah. I had to read it over and over and then I realised it is right. Mm -hmm. Now, if you followed the Beatles, okay, generally it was teenage girls was their biggest audience, yeah. okay? mm -hmm. and they wanted to keep up with the news of the Beatles, and so a lot of them formed fan clubs and joined <coughs> fan clubs, and a lot of them started to buy teen magazines, okay? and the teen magazines would give news about the uh, latest Beatles news and about what they're up to, their records, you know, all this sort of stuff. And also these Beatles, uh, these uh, teen magazines used to have contests. And some of the contests you would uh, win a signed picture of the Beatles or uh, you'd uh, win some sort of like, you know, memorabilia or whatever. But I came across this contest in, uh, is it, say, I think it says Teen Life magazine there. In, uh, I think this was like spring to the summer of 65, okay? And the contest, says that if you write to them, the winner will speak to the Beatles. And I saw this and I thought to myself, there's no way is the Beatles going to phone somebody who lives in rural America or wherever, you know, because of some silly contest in a teen magazine. And anyway, I was reading through a uh, newspaper from a place called Earlville in uh, Illinois, you probably heard of it, and uh, it was a local newspaper, and there was a story there about a, uh, a father of a teenage girl who was, uh, he was at home one night and his wife had gone out and his teenage daughter had gone out. So he was at home on his own and uh, the phone rang. So he picks up the phone and somebody on the phone says, hello, we've got a phone call for you from uh, London, it's John Lennon. <laughs> and he says, yeah, I'm sure you have. And he put the phone down. <laughs> so then about an hour later, his teenage daughter came home 
and uh, he said to her, uh, you won't believe what happened. Some crank phoned here and said John Lennon was on the phone. And of course what she'd done is she'd entered the contest, she'd won, and she still hasn't spoken to her father since. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but luckily enough, I did actually speak to somebody who did speak to the Beatles, who did actually get their phone call. And this was somebody I spoke to in uh, Joliet, and I'll read what it says, because I know it's pretty small, but it's very interesting. She was, uh, I, well, I'll read the, <coughs> it says, okay. Um, we were listening to the Beatles records, looking at Beatles books, and of course talking about the Beatles. I received a phone call telling me that I had won a contest to talk to the Beatles long distance from London, England. I would receive this call at 3 p.m. So at 3 p.m. my friends and I, along with my mother and grandmother, were eagerly awaiting the call. And sure enough, there they were. I remember speaking to Ringo first. Unfortunately, I don't remember what was said. Each of the other girls took turns talking to the Beatles. Paul wasn't there for the first part of the conversation. John kept joking around being silly. I remember this very clearly because I was a George Harrison fan. At the time, I had a Siamese cat I named George. I told George Harrison that I loved my cat as if I was loving him. <laughs> I don't remember his response, but I'm sure he thought I was crazy. We were on the phone for 40 minutes. Oh, wow. 40 minutes. Wow. I mean, just unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, I just can't imagine that today. Taylor Swift calling somebody in rural Illinois for 40 minutes. <laughs> well, I should take that back. I'll take it, if you're listening, Taylor Swift, I'll take it back. You probably would. But I'm just saying, <laughs> it is unusual, though, isn't it? Let's be honest. Mm. So, anyway, now, so the first time people really heard the Beatles was January 64 with I Want to Hold Your Hand. And then the Ed Sullivan show was the first time they really saw them. But in terms of the first time, you really got a, a, an idea of their personalities in depth, okay? I think it's from this film here. And this was A Hard Day's Night that came out in the summer of 64. And it's kind of like a, a, a documentary, but fictional, okay? And anyway, and this f uh, film was shown all over America, uh, shown in Chicago, shown all over. And again, I spoke to somebody who went to see it in Joliet, and that was the ticket you got if you went to see the show. Nice ticket, isn't it? Yeah. And then that was the movie theatre. Not so nice movie theatre, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, and then she was telling me what it was like. And I think what she said was pretty much replicated all over America. Okay? So this is what she told me when she went to see the movie. It can only be described as hysteria. Just imagine about 300 teenage girls scream at the top of their lungs for no legitimate reason. It was a movie, so the Beatles couldn't hear us. I never actually heard anything in the theatre when watching the movie. I first heard the actual dialogue or the storyline when the movie came out on TV. <laughs> now, the first time they came to Chicago, okay, was September 64, okay? And uh, the Beatles, uh, they never stayed overnight in 1964. They came in and then they flew straight on to uh, Detroit. And I'll, I'll say a little bit later about why that is. But so the first time they actually stayed in Chicago was in 1965. Okay, so they stayed here in 1965. And that was the hotel they stayed in. It's no longer there, but it's up on Mannheim Road near the airport. Okay, yeah. there, there is another hotel there now in the same place, but not that one. Anyway, in terms of that hotel, that is a, a new hotel. It had only been built about three or four years earlier. And uh, it was built by somebody who, how can I put this, had connections yeah. with um, um, yes. Chicago's gangsters. I don't know if you know about this. But <laughs> anyway, uh, certainly had connections with that. And he built this hotel, and the hotel was a luxurious hotel had a big outdoor uh, swimming pool, it had luxurious uh, facilities, it had, uh, you know, uh, people used to come and uh, give shows there. It was, a, you know, it was kind of like Las Vegas in uh, Chicago. But anyway, in about 1964, because of financial reasons, he had to sell the hotel. And of course, he ended up then a little bit later getting shot in the street. But anyway, it, uh, he gave up, he sold the hotel, and he sold the hotel to this couple who had nothing to do with Chicago gangsters or anything. They were a, a, a couple that was just basically, you know, uh, buying a hotel because they wanted to make money, okay? Mm. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to change the image because the image of the hotel was it was associated with Chicago gangsters. And they wanted it to be a more family-friendly hotel. 
So therefore, when they heard that the Beatles were coming to Chicago in 1965, they came up with a great idea. And the great idea is, why don't we have the Beatles stay at a hotel? And so they asked the Beatles to stay at their hotel for two nights. So they stayed in Chicago, in Chicago for two nights that occasion. Anyway, and the person I spoke to was the general manager's daughter, okay? And she was 14 at the time, okay? And in the spring of 1965, her father took the family out to a picnic in one of these uh, nature preserves. And uh, he said to her, uh, I've got something to tell you, but you've got a promise you won't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, okay. <laughs> and she said to him, uh, he said to her, the Beatles are staying at our hotel. <laughs> so she collapsed and they brought her around <laughs> and eventually she said, Dada, I won't tell anybody if you let me stay in the hotel. <laughs> so yes, yeah, she stayed for two nights that the Beatles were in the, the hotel in a room opposite the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and she told me what went on. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, but anyway, she did meet them all. She met all the, the, the Beatles and uh, she said they were very nice but uh, very, you know, drunk and whatever. Anyway, but anyway, very <laughs> nice. And uh, she said that uh, she really got to know uh, the, uh, the roadies and that was Neil Aspinall and Mal Evans, if you're yes. familiar with them. And they uh, used to come to her room and she used to talk to them and, you know, she really got on well with them. Anyway, she said to them one day, do you think you could get the Beatles to sign my album? And the album, uh, I'm guessing, would have been probably Help, that had just come out at that time. And so, um, Mal Evans said, yeah, so he went off, anyway. And he came back late with the, the, the album, and it had all the autographs on it, and she was delighted, anyway. And then, uh, when the Beatles left the hotel, she also got a lot of memorabilia from their room, like photographs, uh, all different things, cigarette butts, anyway, <laughs> and all different things from their room. Anyway, when I spoke to her, I spoke to her in about 2015. 16 maybe, a few years ago now anyway. Mm -hmm. And she told me that she just bought all that stuff because she was getting to that age where she didn't really need it. And she bought all the stuff to a uh, auction house. And uh, <coughs> she asked the auction house, how much is all this worth? And they looked at the album and guess what? It wasn't the Beatles who signed it. Oh. It was Mal Evans. Oh. Yeah. And that was quite common at the time because yeah. they had so many requests for autographs that Neil Aspinall and Mel Evans used to do the autographs pretty well by all accounts. Mm -hmm. Anyway, sad story, but anyway. Right. But anyway, in terms of what happened there is that uh, what they did the hotel is they got the Beatles to stay there and they wanted to publicise it, as you would, okay? And the only slight problem was they told the local radio station, WLS, and by that time it would have been WCFL as well, and they uh, publicised the fact that the Beatles were staying at this hotel. <laughs> Not a good idea. <laughs> because, of course, then what happened is thousands of youngsters phoned up the hotel and booked up every single room. <laughs> and so, therefore, this is a picture that was taken the following morning when they left, but you can see still people hanging. So every room was full of parting teenagers. <laughs> and the Beatles arrived there at 4 o'clock in the morning from uh, Houston, and uh, they were greeted by hundreds of teenagers, <laughs> and uh, they spent two nights at the hotel and they didn't get a wink of sleep because every room was full of partying teenagers. <laughs> the moral of the tale is, if the Beatles are staying in your hotel, don't tell anybody. <laughs> but anyway, that's too late. Okay, so uh, how are we doing for time? 2.15. We've got a little bit left. I don't, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I just want to mention a couple of things from the local music scene. The Beatles, you know, this is one of the remarkable things, that uh, when people saw the Ed Sullivan show, they looked at the, uh, the Beatles and they said, I can do that. It looks fun, it looks easy, and I can do it. And so therefore, what happens is, the following day, people went out and they bought instruments. And some of these uh, people that bought instruments learned to play them, some didn't. <laughs> some of them formed groups, some didn't. And some of them even were lucky enough to get recording contracts. Mm. And uh, the first one of these post-Beatles groups that was able to get a top 10 national hit was The Shadows of Night. Mm -hmm. So they, they uh, you probably all know uh, Glory was the uh, song, oh, yeah. yeah. So let me just uh, show you that. Uh, you probably all know this one. It's Gloria. So that was the first top 10 hit from a 
local band that was formed post uh, Ed Sullivan show. And I did actually speak to Jimmy Sons. He was the singer. I'm so, sorry to say he, he passed away last year. But, and he told me that he was inspired to form the band by the Beatles. Okay? But when they started to play the Beatles music, they realized it's not easy to play. It's actually pretty difficult. The, the chord structures are difficult. The harmonies are very difficult to replicate. But lucky enough, another English group came along. And that was the Rolling Stones. And their music was a lot easier to play. And that's why the Shadows of Night sound more like the Rolling Stones than they do the Beatles, which they do. If you listen to their music, they're much more influenced by the, uh, the Stones. But anyway, another group that came along that had the first number one hit uh, post-Beatles was the Buckinghams. And they do sound a bit more like the Beatles. And they got their name from uh, Buckingham Fountain, you, you probably know that in uh, Chicago, but also because it sounds English, Buckingham Palace, yeah, yeah. which a lot of them did. You know, the, uh, the, uh, but anyway, so there was a number of others, but I just wanted to mention them. But I did want to just mention this, and that is, I was looking through, as you do, looking through sort of like local newspapers and uh, whatever, you know, during the, uh, from the 60s, and I kept coming across these female bands, all female bands, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, and maybe you can help me here, before the Beatles, I can't think of one <coughs> all-female band. Or if I can, one, it's one or two. See, you're struggling, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Post-Beatles, there's loads of them. And this just gives you an idea. These are from the local area, so just, just Chicago, and these are just what I found in local newspapers and magazines or whatever. And you can see the band up there on the, called The Same, if you can see them uh, there. And uh, funny enough, I was doing one talk there last year, and I said that, and somebody at the back of the audience shouted out, that's me. <laughs> she was actually in the band. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. yeah. And then the next one there you can see is the Chips. Then there's a, that one there I can't work out actually. They just say it all female band, but they don't say which one. Then you can see another one, Just Us, Marie Antoinette's. You can see the creation, the shape, mm -hmm. the cherubs. Uh, this is, I think this is a great name. They actually a lot of the time they 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 were called the weaker six rather than the weaker six because there is six of them. Mm -hmm. So I kind of think that that, that was the the original time nature anyway but you can see there's a number of them and so therefore the the obvious question is why is this and i think what it is is that when girls saw the beatles on the ed sullivan show they also said i can do that they saw the beatles and let's be honest about the beatles they kind of look androgynous you know they've got yeah. the long hair let's be honest here they're scrawny <coughs> they're not beefcakes you know, they, they come up, you know, beef cut, you know, big muscles, the hairy chest, there's none of that in the Beatles. They're all pretty scrawny sort of uh, boys, pale, you know, and so therefore girls said, and also they're, they're singing harmonies. You know, boys didn't sing harmonies, well, except for the Everly Brothers, but anyway. But in terms of that, therefore, that, what that meant was that when girls saw them, they also saw themselves on the stage and said, I can do that. They never said that when they saw Elvis Presley. Sure. How many female Elvis Presleys are there? <laughs> don't tell me. Some at the back will say I'm one, but I don't. I, anyway, <laughs> I'm just saying. So anyway, I know you want to hear one of these. Can you just? I've got questions at the end, but keep the question if you don't mind. I just want to play this because this is one of my favourites. Okay, and I live in Rogers Park, oh, park. Oh, and this yeah. band come from Rogers yeah. Park. Yeah, okay, sure. and in terms of this group, they're called the Daughters of Eve, and uh, they were obsessed with the Beatles. And they uh, recorded three singles in the 60s. They didn't get any hits, they weren't nothing, you know, they, they kind of didn't last that long and broke up like many of these bands did. And then um, uh, I had copies of their records, you know. And so I'm playing this record, which I'm going to play you, at home one day, and my teenage daughter walks in the room, and she said to me, Dada, that is a TikTok song. <laughs> and I said, I beg your pardon. <laughs> and she said, Dada, they play that all the time on TikTok. <laughs> now, for those that are unfamiliar with it, TikTok is this platform that a lot of younger and older people use to make these silly videos or whatever. But they all have music on them that's, you know, on TikTok. You can pick which music. And what they've done is they've picked a lot of old music that they don't have to pay royalties for, really. Anyway, and one of them was this one. And this has become popular because it was played on TikTok. And then I went into Spotify. If you're familiar with Spotify, the streaming service, they're on Spotify. Wow. And I looked at how many plays this song has got. And the last time I looked, it was over 30 
million. <laughs> Unbelievable. And in terms of, they also tell you how many uh, plays the group gets a month. And the last time I looked, it was a million a month. Wow. So get, isn't that amazing? So that's TikTok for you. These, they're still living. They broke up the band or whatever, and I'm sure they're never going to get back together. A lot of them moved to, they moved to California, whatever. But it's yeah. nice to know uh, they got back. Anyway, would you want to hear them? Yes. yes. I, you know what? I'm always afraid one day I'm going to ask that question that everybody's going to say no. And I'm kind of like, what, what am I going to do? But anyway, I'll, I'll play it. And tell me if it sounds like the beat, so if you can detect the sound. I, Anyway, so you can go on Spotify tonight and make it 30 million and one. <laughs> but anyway, so um, I just want to go on to the last, because I, I, I don't want to uh, run out, I want to leave questions, a bit of time for questions, but I just want to say a little bit about those people that feared the Beatles. Okay, so I'm just going to finish on that, uh, because uh, again, you know, I don't want to spend too much uh, of your time, but uh, let's just go on to that. And... <laughs> 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 Okay, so uh, I can usually show you a photograph of a person, and then I can usually say, "Is this man a Beatles fan?" <laughs> and you can usually tell exactly. You can tell straight away, can't you? But anyway, he was the editor of the Chicago Tribune throughout the sixties. Okay, he hated the Beatles with a passion, mm -hmm. and he wrote a number of uh, editorials about the Beatles, uh, all criticizing them. This is probably my favourite one. You know. And in terms of, this was written in response to their appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show. So when they appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show, he wrote this editorial. And the headline is Human Sheepdogs. Which is a, <laughs> come on, that's a great headline. And then he says, the Beatles, England's gift to the Bobby Soxers, have made their debut to American audiences, armed with electric guitars, drums, and sore throats. They make enough noise to bring the plaster down from the ceiling, but the te teenagers respond by howling in ecstasy. So the criticisms were usually about the music was rubbish, and then it was all often about the, uh, the response to the fans. The female fans often got a lot of criticism in these uh, editorials. But again, uh, the Chicago Tribune hated the, uh, the Beatles with a passion, and the other people that didn't really have much time for the Beatles was the Catholic Church. And most of you probably know the Catholic Church was, you know, very uh, important in Chicago, certainly in the 60s, it's still today, but 60s had the year of City Hall, and they used to have uh, columns in local newspapers, and this was a priest that uh, had a column in uh, a local newspaper from uh, uh, Chicago Austin News, and uh, he had a column that used to come out every week. So you could basically go back and uh, read his column every week, and every column said the same thing. I can summarise it to you here right now, and it is, America is going to the dogs. That's it. I know a lot of you think, oh no, this has only happened in the last few years. People have been saying that for a hundred years. <laughs> you know, but anyway, so uh, America's going to the dogs, and what is his evidence for America's going to the dogs? Yeah, you guessed it, the Beatles. Okay, so what does he say? Here we go. Oh, my. My eyesight. Maybe I should go back out here and see if I can uh, <laughs> read it here. Okay, the bit uh, is uh, this. Where it, so he's, he's talking about America's going to the dog. And then there is the stomach upsetting sight of teenage girls screaming in ecstasy over the ludicrous Beatles. Boys, beatniks with high voices and swinging hips trying to act like girls. 
<laughs> anyway. <laughs> Every time I show this picture, the same response, and I don't quite know what it is, it's kind of like a groan. I don't even know what it is. You know? But anyway, uh, for those that don't know, this man uh, was uh, mayor of Chicago from 1955 until he died in office in December 76. And yeah, and then his son after that, and then basically if he hadn't become, if he hadn't died in office in uh, something, he'd still be mayor today. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so in terms of Mayor Daly, in this picture, this picture was taken in the summer of 64, and as you can see, he's a worried man. Mm. He really is. And he's worried because of a, there's a couple of things going on. One is the civil rights movement in the city. There's a lot of uh, boycotts of schools, there's a lot of walkouts. That's a real worry. But there's something really worrying coming to Chicago, and that, of course, is the Beatles. <laughs> the Beatles are coming. And he's read all of the, the uh, newspapers about the Beatles, and he knows that wherever there's been, there's trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, he comes up, with all the great minds, I mean, of the, obviously, of the Chicago uh, political establishment, he comes up with a great plan to avoid trouble in Chicago. It's a two-pronged plan, and what can go wrong here? I, I can't think of it. But anyway, the first one is he won't let them stay overnight in the city. No. So no hotel can put up the Beatles in 1964. <coughs> so they fly in at about 4.30 in the evening. They go to uh, the uh, Stockyard Inn, and they do a press conference. Then they play their concert. Then they collect their instruments, go back to the airport, and they've left Chicago by 11.30 at night. Seven hours, that's all they spent in. That's amazing. Isn't it? But anyway, so that was the first part of the plan. But the second part of the plan was he knew also that when they used to uh, fly into uh, cities, that there'd be a crowd at the airport. Mm -hmm. So again, his great uh, second pronged part of the plan <coughs> was he was going to keep it a secret where they were landing. Mm -hmm. So therefore, nobody would show up. That had solved that problem. The only slight problem was that the promoter in Chicago has somebody whom they call a publicity officer. And a publicity officer's job is to get publicity. Yeah. And so, of course, what he did is he told all the local radio and uh, TV stations that the Beatles were coming in to uh, O'Hare Airport at 4.30. So Mayor Daly went absolutely nuts. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I had this image, he phoned up the airline, but I had this image of him phoning up the pilot. <laughs> and the plane coming into O'Hare and then sort of going back up again. But anyway, in terms of what happens then, he then told them that they had to come into Midway. And so the, the plane then landed at Midway Airport. But of course, yeah, you got it. The publicity officer again told the radio stations, and yes, about 5,000 kids showed up at Midway. But to avoid them seeing the Beatles, the plane landed at a remote airfield right in the distance. And when you can, there is pictures of this. When the Beatles got off the plane, they went straight into a limo. The police took them straight into a limo and drove them straight to the uh, stockyard uh, uh, inn. So that was it. So that was closer yeah. Than anyway. yeah. yeah. So that's basically uh, the Beatles in uh, uh, Chicago. Okay. My last. I'll show you this, and then if, if we got time, I hope we can have a few questions. I think we have. But I just want to show you this because. Uh, the, Mayor Daly uh, was such a, an important person that if you wanted anything to happen in Chicago, you wrote to Mayor Daly. And uh, a lot of Beatles fans wrote to Mayor Daly because they wanted tickets for the show, they wanted to meet the Beatles, they wanted to give them a present, they wanted whatever. And somebody wrote to Mayor Daly and wanted to uh, give them the keys to the city. Okay, they wanted to present the keys of the city to the Beatles. And the person that always used to answer these letters was not Mayor Daly, who was too busy, but was this man here, and he, his name is Jack Riley. And he was like, the, he was like an assistant to uh, Mayor Daly. And again, I'll try that uh, quiz with you again. Is he a Beatles fan? <laughs> okay, so anyway, some girls wrote to him and said that they wanted to present the keys to the city to uh, uh, the Beatles, and this is his response. Okay, this is what he wrote to them girls. This is in the summer of 64. Please believe me, the Beatles will come to Chicago and the Beatles will leave the next day. The world will not change one bit because of their appearance here and their departure. 
A year from now, some other entertainer will occupy the spotlight and you'll be wondering who were the Beatles, <laughs> faintly remembering you had heard that name somewhere. <laughs> so here we are 60 years later, we're still talking about the Beatles, and I must be about the only person that is talking about Jack Riley. <laughs>